Today is June 5th. I'm Serena, and welcome to the Seven Streams Bible Reading Method. We are in the Nation Stream today and reading from the book of 1 Kings. We'll cover chapters 4 through 7 today as we read from the New Living Translation. 1 Kings, chapter 4. King Solomon now ruled over all Israel, and these were his high officials. Azariah, son of Zadok, was the priest. Elihoreph and Ahijah, the sons of Shisha, were court secretaries. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was the royal historian. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was commander of the army. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. Azariah, son of Nathan, was in charge of the district governors. Zabud, son of Nathan, a priest, was a trusted advisor to the king. Ahishar was manager of the palace property. Adoniram, son of Abda, was in charge of forced labor. Solomon also had twelve district governors who were over all Israel. They were responsible for providing food for the king's household. Each of them arranged provisions for one month of the year. These are the names of the twelve governors. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim, ben Daker in Makaz, Sha'abim, Beth-Shemesh, and Elan-Beth-Hanan, Ben-Hesed in Aruboth, including Sako and all the land of Hefer, Ben-Abinadab in all of Nephoth-Dor. He was married to Tephoth, one of Solomon's daughters. Ba'ana, son of Ahilud, in Ta'anak and Megiddo, all of Beth Sha'an, near Zarathon, below Jezreel, and all the territory from Beth Sha'an to Abel Meholah and over the Jokmiam, Ben Geber in Ramoth Gilead, including the towns of Jair, named for Jair of the tribe of Manasseh, in Gilead, and in the Argob region of Bashan, including sixty large fortified towns with bronze bars on their gates. Ahinadab, son of Edo, in Mahanaim. Ahimaaz in Naphtali. He was married to Basemath, another of Solomon's daughters. Baana, son of Hushai, in Asher, and in Aloth. Jehoshaphat, son of Parua, in Issachar. Shimei, son of Elah, in Benjamin. Geber, son of Uri, in the land of Gilead, including the territories of King Sihon of the Amorites and King Og of Bashan. There was also one governor over the land of Judah. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They were very contented, with plenty to eat and drink. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates River in the north to the land of the Philistines and the border of Egypt in the south. The conquered peoples of these lands sent tribute money to Solomon and continued to serve him throughout his lifetime. The daily food requirements for Solomon's palace were 150 bushels of choice flour and 300 bushels of meal. Also, 10 oxen from the fattening pens, 20 pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep or goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roe deer, and choice poultry. Solomon's dominion extended over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates River, from Tipsah to Gaza, and there was peace on all his borders. During the lifetime of Solomon, all of Judah and Israel lived in peace and safety, and from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, Each family had its own home and garden. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for his chariot horses, and he had 12,000 horses. The district governors faithfully provided food for King Solomon and his court. Each made sure nothing was lacking during the month assigned to him. They also brought the necessary barley and straw for the royal horses in the stables. God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding, and knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the East and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, 
including Ethan the Ezrahite and the sons of Mahal, Heman, Kalkol, and Darda. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs and wrote 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority about all kinds of plants, from the great cedar of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows from cracks in a wall. He could also speak about animals, birds, small creatures, and fish. And kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. King Hiram of Tyre had always been a loyal friend of David. When Hiram learned that David's son, Solomon, was the new king of Israel, he sent ambassadors to congratulate him. Then Solomon sent this message back to Hiram. You know that my father David was not able to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord, his God, because of the many wars waged against him by surrounding nations. He could not build until the Lord gave him victory over all his enemies. But now the Lord my God has given me peace on every side. I have no enemies, and all is well. So I am planning to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord my God, just as he had instructed my father David. For the Lord told him, Your son, whom I will place on your throne, will build the temple to honor my name. Therefore, please command that cedars from Lebanon be cut for me. Let my men work alongside yours, and I will pay your men whatever wages you ask. As you know, there is no one among us who can cut timber like you Sidonians. When Hiram received Solomon's message, he was very pleased and said, Praise the Lord today for giving David a wise son to be king of the great nation of Israel. Then he sent this reply to Solomon, I have received your message, and I will supply all the cedar and cypress timber you need. My servants will bring the logs from the Lebanon mountains to the Mediterranean Sea and make them into rafts and float them along the coast to whatever place you choose. Then we will break the rafts apart so you can carry the logs away. You can pay me by supplying me with food for my household. So Hiram supplied as much cedar and cypress timber as Solomon desired. In return, Solomon sent him an annual payment of 100,000 bushels of wheat for his household and 110,000 gallons of pure olive oil. So the Lord gave wisdom to Solomon, just as he had promised. And Hiram and Solomon made a formal alliance of peace. Then King Solomon conscripted a labor force of 30,000 men from all Israel. He sent them to Lebanon in shifts, 10,000 every month, so that each man would be one month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of this labor force. Solomon also had 70,000 common laborers, 80,000 quarry workers in the hill country, and 3,600 foremen to supervise the work. At the king's command, they quarried large blocks of high-quality stone and shaped them to make the foundation of the temple. Men from the city of Gebal helped Solomon's and Hiram's builders prepare the timber and stone for the temple. It was in mid-spring, in the month of Ziv, during the fourth year of Solomon's reign, that he began to construct the Temple of the Lord. This was 480 years after the people of Israel were rescued from their slavery in the land of Egypt. The temple that King Solomon built for the Lord was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. The entry room at the front of the temple was 30 feet wide, running across the entire width of the temple. It projected outward 15 feet from the front of the temple. Solomon also made narrow, recessed windows throughout the temple. He built a complex of rooms against the outer walls of the temple, all the way around the sides and rear of the building. The complex was three stories high, the bottom floor being seven and a half feet wide, the second floor nine feet wide, and the top floor ten and a half feet wide. The rooms were connected to the walls of the temple by beams resting on ledges built out from the wall. 
so the beams were not inserted into the walls themselves. The stones used in the construction of the temple were finished at the quarry, so there was no sound of hammer, axe, or any other iron tool at the building site. The entrance to the bottom floor was on the south side of the temple. There were winding stairs going up to the second floor, and another flight of stairs between the second and third floors. After completing the temple structure, Solomon put in a seating made of cedar beams and planks. As already stated, he built a complex of rooms along the sides of the building attached to the temple walls by cedar timbers. Each story of the complex was seven and a half feet high. Then the Lord gave this message to Solomon. Concerning this temple you are building, if you keep all my decrees and regulations and obey all my commands, I will fulfill through you the promise I made to your father, David. I will live among the Israelites and will never abandon my people, Israel. So Solomon finished building the temple. The entire inside from floor to ceiling was paneled with wood. He paneled the walls and ceilings with cedar, and he used planks of cypress for the floors. He partitioned off an inner sanctuary, the most holy place, at the far end of the temple. It was 30 feet deep and was paneled with cedar from floor to ceiling. The main room of the temple, outside the most holy place, was 60 feet long. Cedar paneling completely covered the stone walls throughout the temple, and the paneling was decorated with carvings of gourds and open flowers. He prepared the inner sanctuary at the far end of the temple, where the Ark of the Lord's Covenant would be placed. This inner sanctuary was 30 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 30 feet high. He overlaid the inside with solid gold. He also overlaid the altar made of cedar. Then Solomon overlaid the rest of the temple's interior with solid gold, and he made gold chains to protect the entrance to the most holy place. So he finished overlaying the entire temple with gold, including the altar that belonged to the most holy place. He made two cherubim of wild olive wood, each 15 feet tall, and placed them in the inner sanctuary. The wingspan of each of the cherubim was 15 feet, each wing being seven and a half feet long. The two cherubim were identical in shape and size. Each was 15 feet tall. He placed them side by side in the inner sanctuary of the temple. Their outspread wings reached from wall to wall, while their inner wings touched at the center of the room. He overlaid the two cherubim with gold. He decorated all the walls of the inner sanctuary and the main room with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. He overlaid the floor in both rooms with gold. For the entrance to the inner sanctuary, he made double doors of wild olive wood with five-sided doorposts. These double doors were decorated with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. The doors, including the decorations of cherubim and palm trees, were overlaid with gold. Then he made four-sided doorposts of wild olive wood for the entrance to the temple. There were two folding doors of cypress wood, and each door was hinged to fold back upon itself. These doors were decorated with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, all overlaid evenly with gold. The walls of the inner courtyard were built so that there was one layer of cedar beams between every three layers of finished stone. The foundation of the Lord's temple was laid in mid-spring, in the month of Ziv, during the fourth year of Solomon's reign. The entire building was completed in every detail by mid-autumn, in the month of Bull, during the eleventh year of his reign. So it took seven years to build the temple. Solomon also built a palace for himself, and it took him 13 years to complete the construction. One of Solomon's buildings was called the Palace of the Forest of Lebanon. It was 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. There were four rows of cedar pillars, and great cedar beams rested on the pillars. 
The hall had a cedar roof. Above the beams on the pillars were 45 side rooms, arranged in three tiers of 15 each. On each end of the long hall were three rows of windows facing each other. All the doorways and doorposts had rectangular frames and were arranged in sets of three, facing each other. Solomon also built the Hall of Pillars, which was 75 feet long and 45 feet wide. There was a porch in front, along with a canopy supported by pillars. Solomon also built the throne room, known as the Hall of Justice, where he sat to hear legal matters. It was paneled with cedar from floor to ceiling. Solomon's living quarters surrounded a courtyard behind this wall, and they were constructed the same way. He also built similar living quarters for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had married. From foundation to eaves, all these buildings were built from huge blocks of high-quality stone, cut with saws and trimmed to exact measure on all sides. Some of the huge foundation stones were 15 feet long, and some were 12 feet long. The blocks of high-quality stone used in the walls were also cut to measure, and cedar beams were also used. The walls of the great courtyard were built so that there was one layer of cedar beams between every three layers of finished stone, just like the walls of the inner courtyard of the Lord's temple with its entry room. King Solomon then asked for a man named Huram to come from Tyre. He was half Israelite, since his mother was a widow from the tribe of Naphtali, and his father had been a craftsman in bronze from Tyre. Huram was extremely skillful and talented in any work in bronze, and he came to do all the metalwork for King Solomon. Huram cast two bronze pillars, each 27 feet tall and 18 feet in circumference. From the tops of the pillars he cast bronze capitals, each seven and a half feet tall. Each capital was decorated with seven sets of latticework and interwoven chains. He also encircled the latticework with two rows of pomegranates to decorate the capitals over the pillars. The capitals on the columns inside the entry room were shaped like water lilies, and they were six feet tall. The capitals on the two pillars had 200 pomegranates in two rows around them, beside the rounded surface next to the latticework. Huram set the pillars at the entrance of the temple, one toward the south and one toward the north. He named the one on the south Jachin and the one on the north Boaz. The capitals on the pillars were shaped like water lilies, and so the work on the pillars was finished. Then Huram cast a great round basin, 15 feet across from rim to rim, called the sea. It was seven and a half feet deep and about 45 feet in circumference. It was encircled just below its rim by two rows of decorative gourds. There were about six gourds per foot all the way around, and they were cast as part of the basin. The sea was placed on a base of 12 bronze oxen, all facing outward. Three faced north, three faced west, three faced south, and three faced east, and the sea rested on them. The walls of the sea were about three inches thick, and its rim flared out like a cup and resembled a water lily blossom. It could hold about 11,000 gallons of water. Huram also made ten bronze water carts, each six feet long, six feet wide, and four and a half feet tall. They were constructed with side panels braced with crossbars. Both the panels and the crossbars were decorated with carved lions, oxen, and cherubim. Above and below the lions and oxen were wreath decorations. Each of these carts had four bronze wheels and bronze axles. There were supporting posts for the bronze basins at the corners of the carts, These supports were decorated on each side with carvings of wreaths. The top of each cart had a rounded frame for the basin. It projected one and a half feet above the cart's top like a round pedestal, and its opening was two and a quarter feet across. It was decorated on the outside with carvings of wreaths. The panels of the cart were square, not round. 
Under the panels were four wheels that were connected to axles that had been cast as one unit with the cart. The wheels were two and a quarter feet in diameter and were similar to chariot wheels. The axles, spokes, rims, and hubs were all cast from molten bronze. There were handles at each of the four corners of the carts, and these two were cast as one unit with the cart. Around the top of each cart was a rim nine inches wide. The corner supports and side panels were cast as one unit with the cart. Carvings of cherubim, lions, and palm trees decorated the panels and corner supports wherever there was room, and there were wreaths all around. All ten water carts were the same size and were made alike, for each was cast from the same mold. Huram also made ten smaller bronze basins, one for each cart. Each basin was six feet across and could hold 220 gallons of water. He set five water carts on the south side of the temple and five on the north side. The great bronze basin called the sea was placed near the southeast corner of the temple. He also made the necessary wash basins, shovels, and bowls. So at last, Huram completed everything King Solomon had assigned him to make for the temple of the Lord. The two pillars, the two bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars, the two networks of interwoven chains that decorated the capitals, the 400 pomegranates that hung from the chains on the capitals, two rows of pomegranates for each of the chain networks that decorated the capitals on top of the pillars, the 10 water carts holding the 10 basins, the sea and the 12 oxen under it, the ash buckets, the shovels, and the bowls. Huram made all these things of burnished bronze for the temple of the Lord, just as King Solomon had directed. The king had them cast in clay molds in the Jordan Valley between Succoth and Zarathon. Solomon did not weigh all these things because there were so many. The weight of the bronze could not be measured. Solomon also made all the furnishings of the temple of the Lord, the gold altar, the gold table for the bread of the presence, the lampstands of solid gold, five on the south and five on the north, in front of the most holy place, the flower decorations, lamps and tongs, all of gold, the small bowls, lamp snuffers, bowls, ladles, and incense burners, all of solid gold, the doors for the entrances to the most holy place and the main room of the temple with their fronts overlaid with gold. So King Solomon finished all his work on the temple of the Lord. Then he brought all the gifts his father David had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and the various articles, and he stored them in the treasuries of the Lord's temple. Dear God, we learn of the temple that was the highest of priorities and so engrossing for so many. And it's humbling and inspiring to hear and learn and know that we are now the temple that you were always interested in. You have created us to be beauty and you have invested in us. So much worth is invested in us. Your love for us is a marvel. Amen. In chapter 4, Solomon was what gets called large and in charge. He inherited the most powerful kingdom in existence at the time. His father David had expanded the borders to the greatest they had ever been. The residents of the newly absorbed areas sent in tribute money, and Solomon commenced building the kingdom to be even greater and more than it had ever been. It blossomed to the height of its greatness under Solomon. The peace and prosperity in culture, music, and education was a national marvel that left countless people enthralled just to visit Jerusalem and the rest of the country. The national administration of officers and governors are listed. Just a note in case it is news, the Hebrew prefix ben before a name means son of. It's the same as in English putting son at the end of a name, or S-E-N in Swedish, and the prefix, 
<laughs> the prefix mc m c in Gaelic. So you see the pattern here? So the people were numerous. The population along with Solomon's staff, everybody's well fed. The stalls are filled with animals, including the horses for royalty. Did you catch how many? Thousands of horses? Solomon is riding voluminously and Ambassadors come from all over the world to learn from Solomon. Solomon had asked for wisdom in 1 Kings 3. Also, it's stated in 2 Chronicles 1. And God granted his request. In chapter 5, the preparations for the building of the temple went into high production. The relationship with Lebanon and her leaders was rich, deep, and warm. They traded heavily as Lebanon supplied cedar and staffing as Israel offered food in exchange. To put it into what may be simpler to envision, the wheat shipped north was 12 plus full-size truckloads per year, and there were no semi-trucks at the time. The olive oil sent each year to Lebanon was a volume that would fill four full-size in-ground swimming pools. The staffing and labor and construction crews, supervisors, were more than 180,000 men. They began making the timber and the stone for the temple and more projects that Solomon had planned. In chapter 6, the temple begins construction. Can you imagine the excitement? It was 480 years since leaving Egypt and the goal of the culture was under construction. Notice in verse 7, that there was no sound of hammer, axe, or any iron tool. There was no sawing sound either. Hmm? How is that possible? A construction site that's nearly silent? But this was the house of God, and it was a reverent undertaking. Mid-job, God reminded them that they would have God's presence with them eternally as long as they kept His commands. The dimensions of the temple are given again. The details of the interior are listed. The intricacies are boggling and beautiful. Can you imagine the aroma of all the cedar and the breathtaking beauty of all the gold? Goodness, goodness, good heavens. The temple was up in the realm of seven years, and it was astonishing to gaze at. The expense and the staffing, the transport, the work being done in silence— We've heard a clear and intriguingly credible description from a world-renowned leader that this temple could not be built today. In chapter 7, Solomon then built his palace to be his residence. There was also the palace of the forest of Lebanon, the hall of pillars, the throne room, and the hall of justice. Solomon is quite the architect. Then a man named Huram is conscripted to come and do metalwork and carvings. His skill is legendary in his giftedness. The things he made, carved, shaped, and formed are mind-boggling. It's difficult to envision at all. He made things for the temple, plus numerous furnishings for the temple. When the temple was completed, all the dedicated gifts were brought in and stored in the treasury of the temple. Can you imagine that this was completed? What a magnificent edifice. But it was more than a building. It was meant to invite the Most Holy God to come and dwell with people. So I've included an illustration of the temple, and it is associated with the the actual episode on the website when you go to the website which is sevenstreamsmethod.com and that takes you to the website where all of the episodes are hosted tomorrow we will portage back to the wisdom stream and back to the book of psalms know that nothing can separate you from the love of god until tomorrow i'm serena sailing with you down the seven streams